Hello and welcome to Bupa Academy for Small Businesses. I'm your host, Holly Tucker. Today, I'll be discussing how small businesses can play a vital role in creating inclusive and supportive environments by supporting women's health in the workplace. We will be covering three different areas, including menopause, supporting parents and female cancer. I'm delighted to welcome our guests, Laura Williams, Head of Partnerships Legal Team at WorkNest. WorkNest provide employers with HR expertise, employment law and health and safety services. Laura is a qualified solicitor and has 15 years of experience in the legal sector supporting SMEs and Dr. Naveen Puri, Medical Director at Bupa. Naveen has 20 years experience as a doctor, working within both the NHS and Bupa. Amongst his areas of clinical interest is health inequality and variation in healthcare, including in women's health. Before I begin, I wanted to highlight that although we refer to women throughout this session, we do recognise that members of the transgender, non-binary and intersex community may also be experiencing these issues too. So, Naveen, could you start by explaining why it's so important for small businesses to support women's health? Yeah, well, thank you for asking the question, Holly. The first thing I'd want to say is that women's health isn't just an issue that affects women. The workplace is made up of women, of course, but also by men who are interacting with, related to, and, uh, you know, invested in the healthcare and well-being of women as well. So it's really important that we consider that this is an issue for everyone to be aware of. Women experience um, different life stages to men. And so I think one thing that could be quite useful for us to consider is things like the fact that they experience periods, pregnancy, issues around fertility, and the menopause further in life. And at various stages in life, there can be different needs that arise as well. And those can impact them in the workplace too. There may also be barriers to women experiencing um, support around healthcare, both visible and invisible too. A common invisible barrier is just a lack of understanding, but also common visible barriers might be the lack of restroom facilities or the ability to take a break when they're in the middle of a hot flush, for example, for a menopausal women. So it's really important that we recognise those uh, are at play as well. We've got some statistics that show that one in four women have indicated that they recognise that their health issues have led to a barrier to them being promoted. Mm. And one one in five women have potentially been impacted uh, in terms of their desire to stay at work as well. And so I think when you consider that half of your workforce potentially, with all that resource, all that training, all that investment, may want to leave your firms because they haven't got that support or opportunity for onward progression, then this is really something we need to make uh, a priority in terms of us addressing. So. Having outlined all of that then, what can workplaces do to help women? And so what I want to do is highlight some positives that workplaces and employers and managers in particular can take forward to help their workforce. One thing is to start conversations and create a culture around openness. If you've got a culture where people are joking about periods or joking about the menopause, just think about those that are experiencing it. And I think some reframing there could be really, really helpful. Maybe inquiring around menopause awareness day who's going through the menopause and what symptoms may be being experienced remember by investing in these conversations and in starting to create a culture which may be more open you're going to retain your talent you're going to retain a, a stronger and more effective workforce you will potentially reduce absenteeism and i think it becomes a much more attractive place for people to work at as well word gets out and you may find your recruitment drives become much more successful because you are a much more healthier place to work in Wow, gosh, so many interesting points. Another question, Naveen. Um, six in every 10 women feel their menopausal symptoms have had a negative impact on their work. For those who don't know, can you tell us what are some of the key symptoms of the menopause and how they might impact employees while they're actually at work? Absolutely, Holly. I think it's really important we consider symptoms because they are so variable and there's so many of them that people often don't have a true understanding of what the menopause can do and how it can affect somebody. Let's start off by saying that symptoms don't affect everybody and they don't often have a, a huge effect on many people. But for one in four, they can certainly have a significant impact. And therefore, it's important that we are aware of these. Menopausal symptoms can go on from, you know, a few days to 
many months and certainly can occur from years before the menopause and up to seven years afterwards as well. So it's not just a date like an anniversary or a birthday, it's actually a whole t a period of your life that can be impacted by the menopause. So it's really important that we have some awareness around this. So in terms of specific symptoms then, I think one that we're all aware of is changes to your periods. And by that I mean things like irregular periods, periods becoming more heavier or more lighter. So it's really important you recognise the impact of that. Women will sometimes be used to predicting their periods and therefore working around that in the workplace. But if that regularity or pattern changes, it can really have an impact on their ability day to day. Another common symptom, which I think has a lot of misunderstanding around it, is a hot flush. And so a hot flush essentially is an intense sensation of heat which starts in the head and works its way downwards and can be accompanied by things like anxiety or even palpitations as well. By palpitations, I mean an increasingly forceful heartbeat or an awareness of your heartbeat as well. And so hot flushes, again, you know, can have a real impact. They can last from seconds to hours sometimes and can come on without any warning whatsoever. So if you're in the middle of a task or you know, doing something particularly important like a presentation and suddenly a hot flush comes on, you can only imagine the impact that would have on your ability to perform your day-to-day -day functions. Other symptoms might include joint um, dysfunction, joint pains, aches, stiffness, etc., and effects on mobility. We also find women can find their sleep is disturbed as well. Insomnia is a really big issue. And in combination with that, hot flushes don't just occur during the day, they can occur during the night as well and also impact sleep. So with insomnia and hot flushes as well, sleep quality can really be affected with all the knock-on consequences that come with that. We also find that some people find their sex drive is affected as well. There can be a real lack of libido and that can also therefore impact relationships as well. So consider the wider impact of that. Things like urinary problems can also be an issue. We find that some women find they pee less predictably or they are more prone to infections as well. So it's really important we consider the impacts there too. I just, I'm just, I'm in, uh, listening to you intently there because I've, I've obviously been involved in small businesses all my life and uh, run one right now. And actually, small businesses have small teams. And so, if you do have a vast majority of that small team um, going through something like this, it's so important, as you said, to have this open dialogue um, and as you said as well to be sensitive to when you might bring it up it's not something you might do in the team meeting let's say um, unless everyone's being very open about it but actually creating that ability for someone just to tell you this is what they're going through um, and as a, I have a team of all women uh, various ages um, quite a few of us going through perimenopausal symptoms or menopausal symptoms um, and we've luckily got an open culture so we can be quite open open about this and it just makes it normal and it makes it actually a supportive environment and I think then uh, as you said it leads to employment and en employee engagement mm -hmm. retention a uh, safety feel uh, feeling that you belong all of these things and I think um, it's not to be underestimated is it absolutely a smaller team can be impacted much much more and to have that level of um, openness can really impact you positively all the more as well Correct. Um, Laura, so as um, we've heard, workplaces can be hard on women, uh, especially when there are no clear or um, inclusive policies to support them. Uh, what policies can small businesses introduce to better support women experiencing the menopause? Yeah, well, I think to, to build on what you're both saying there, there's been a real positive change in awareness yes, of menopause there? and how it impacts women at work. A really good starting point and one I would encourage businesses to do is to implement a menopause policy. Um, and what that can do really to build on what Naveen was saying is um, it can help to reaffirm your business culture, encourage the open conversation, inform, so provide some information, um, provide the name of an individual who might be your you know, menopause champion, for example, someone you can go to for a bit of support or um, if you need any adjustments. So if you are struggling with more severe symptoms of the menopause, who to go to to have a conversation. And like you say, encourage that open discussion about it. Certainly the SMEs that we advise, we've seen the positive impact of having more inclusive policies can have both on culturally and also with employee engagement as well. Absolutely. Naveen, back to you. What are some of the other practical ways businesses can help employees who might be experiencing the menopause? So we've touched on a few things and, and 
certainly uh, Laura's suggestions I think are really pertinent in terms of having a formal menopause policy but sometimes it's the softer things that can also make a difference as well and getting to know what your employees individual needs are can be really really fruitful so while I've mentioned things like instituting a desk fan or giving someone control of the air conditioning unit I'd also encourage you to recognize that your your staff have a wealth of uh, insights themselves and actually utilizing them as an expert resource can be really really useful and so Starting conversations, I think, is a really good first step because you'll come up with a whole host of solutions that perhaps you hadn't thought of uh, your, yourself. Practical solutions might also include um, flexibility. So, you know, when it comes to the menopause, it can really have an impact on how somebody works day to day. Symptoms can be quite debilitating. And so giving individuals the flexibility to excuse themselves from a meeting, perhaps work more flexibly in terms of environments so or working from home rather than the office or in a place that is more conducive to their well-being could also be helpful. I'd also consider perhaps offering flexibility around hours as well. Some women may recognise that their symptoms are particularly bad first thing in the morning or last thing in the evening and so giving them that flexibility to undertake their work to the best of their ability when they find that they can be most productive can also be helpful. There is also, thankfully, some formal support that Bupa can provide as well. So I'd like to speak to that, if I may, because I think this can be really helpful for our listeners. Bupa has a women's health hub online, which is available to anybody, whether you're a Bupa customer or not. And we're really proud of the content on that because it's written by clinicians who have a really vested interest in providing the best outcomes and information for our customers. I'd also share that the information is written to a standard which means it's accessible to everyone. So doctors like me can be very guilty of speaking in jargon, but the good news is this content is really patient friendly or customer friendly. And so please feel free to have a look at that. And it's for everyone, not just for women. I'd also um, direct you to our line manager guides as well, because as Laura mentioned, while there are uh, things such as policies we can put into place, actually sometimes managers just don't know where to start. And so a good port of call might be one of our line manager guides, which are written specifically with a health focus and lens uh, at their core. And then looking at some of the paid services within Bupa, we do have a number of health products and plans that could be really useful for a woman under undergoing the menopause. We have as it says on the tin, a menopause plan, which is a specific appointment dedicated uh, to addressing any symptom and all symptoms of the menopause and coming up with an action plan for that. And there's also a follow-up appointment which is provided as part of that plan as well. We also, uh, moving away from the menopause, have women's health assessments as well. And these tend to focus more around uh, women's cancers, so providing cervical screening and breast screening, but also a woman can raise any other health issue she wants to. And so within the context of that, anything can be discussed. And finally, if your plan with Bupa includes mental health cover. We recognise that the menopause and other women's health issues can cause a mental health impact. And so the mental health cover will provide you with access to a trained professional who can take a call from you, essentially ask you a few questions and assess your needs, and then refer you on to other services that may be useful for you. Sometimes this may also involve referral to a mental health professional. And by accessing the, men the mental health uh, cover, you may find you can do that without having to speak to a GP in the interim. Incredible, absolutely amazing service. Laura, what are some of the business risks of not supporting menopause in the workplace? So I think on a day-to-day -day level, that disengagement, um, people don't feel supported. It leads to increased absences from work. Um, depending on how it's been handled, it might result in a grievance, which is then, obviously, there's a process to be followed then to investigate that and, and outcome it. That, again, just takes time and energy away from, um, from growing your business and productivity generally. Um, as we've mentioned briefly earlier, it might also have an impact on recruitment. Um, people you know, looking to, if they want to come work for your business, they'll often look at employee feedback and what they're saying about what kind of culture it's like to work there. And on the flip side, from uh, reputationally as well, you know, it's the real open, a positive way, real open conversation about menopause now across a range of business sectors. And I think being a positive contributor to that conversation is only going to be good for your reputation as a business. And obviously from the from legal side of things, there's obviously risks of um, claims for discrimination based on age, um, sex, disability, depending on circumstances. Um, similarly, there was a very high profile case of unfair dismissal where long serving member of staff, they'd be going through a performance management process or in a final written warning, they actually produced evidence from their GP to say the impact of the, the menopause ex they're experiencing were impacting on their performance at work for various reasons. The um, employer chose to disregard that or thought they knew better, moved to dismissal, and then they resulted in a, in a hefty unfair dismissal claim. So it can be you know, costly financially from that side of things as well. So there is um, inherent risk there. We're nearly at the end of our first session, but before we move on, 
let's look at the top takeaways from our experts. By addressing women's health and providing better support, businesses can play a vital role in creating an inclusive and supportive environment. Introducing a menopause policy will provide women with the support to regain control of their health and their well-being. And left unsupported, the menopause can lead to disengagement, increased absent levels and potential loss of talent. Next up, we'll be moving on to our second part of the session. Naveen, having children is a monumental event in someone's life. What advice would you give to small business owners to ensure they're fully supporting expectant mothers in the workplace? Well, well the first thing I'd say is that it's really important you encourage your employees to stay as healthy as possible. A healthy workforce leads to great output and, and great positive things for your business. But in particular, there needs to be a focus around the health of a pregnant woman as well. Some pregnancies may have complications alongside them as well. While we recognise that pregnancy is a very natural part of a human condition, sometimes there are condi uh, complications that can occur from diabetes to high blood pressure, the need to see a doctor more frequently for other checks. And so do be mindful of that too. Now, while stating that pregnancy is a very natural process, there are also some things that can go wrong or symptoms that can start to occur for some women. So to be mindful of this, I think, can be very useful. And I'll share some of these with you yeah, now because I think please. this could be helpful for our listeners. We know that bowel and bladder symptoms can be common in pregnancy from things like constipation, developing piles because of their pregnancy, uh, needing to go for a wee more frequently because the pregnancy is pressing down the bladder uh, and such like as well can be an issue. Dental issues are also common, so bleeding gums are a common factor, and that can affect taste, uh, ability to hydrate, and, and things of that nature as well. Heartburn can be a big factor too. When you consider there is a pregnancy growing inside the abdomen, which is pushing up on the stomach, it can cause a real sensation of discomfort. There can also be swelling as well, from the hands to the feet, the legs, the arms, and so it's really important that you factor that that may impact people's ability to use their hands or to walk, etc., as well. Mental health issues are also common. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that some women can get quite anxious or feel quite low during parts of their pregnancy. And it's important that we recognise that. And finally, I think the one that most of us are aware of is nausea, sickness uh, and, and vomiting as well. So please be conscious of that too. Now, the good news is there's lots that businesses can do, but you need to have an awareness of those symptoms to be able to respond to them. So common things that we find helpful are offering frequent breaks uh, as and when required and allowing your women to work flexibly so that they can perform when they're feeling well and feeling good and perhaps take a time out when they need to address and, and tend to their symptoms. Reducing numbers of hours worked or the location of work can also be helpful as well, allowing, for example, flexible working from home or to another environment which may be more conducive to a woman's well-being can be helpful too. When it comes to swelling and uh, the collection of fluid, particularly down by the feet and the legs, offering a stool can be a really simple solution for that. We also find that um, adjusting the task that your employee may have to un undertake could also be helpful as well. If there's heavy lifting, for example, consider that perhaps that isn't the most kindest thing for that employee to have to do, or long distance travel, particularly at the later stages of pregnancy. It may be more appropriate to find another person in your firm to do that and reallocate duties to your pregnant employee who no doubt will take on whatever other responsibilities you might find could be helpful. And then the other one I'd mention is providing adequate ventilation. Sometimes simple things like a desk fan, providing access to a window can be really helpful because, you know, carrying that extra weight can generate lots more heat and therefore in a hot environment or on a hot day, that can be even more cumbersome. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm recognising all of the things that you've been saying there. As someone who has had many women um, fall pregnant, have their babies um, are under my care or not like you, not as a doctor, but um, it's so important that you have this open communication. I think along with everything that they're worried about in terms of their symptoms and how they're feeling, they're also very anxious that this is their job that they might really care about, well I hope they care about, and you're also looking to make them feel supported. So I think again it's all about this open communication that they feel that they can share how they're feeling, if they're feeling anxious about maybe having maternity cover 
over, uh, when they might be coming back, what's going to happen without them. And the same with the employer as well is also anxious about losing this magnificent person. Um, how can they stay in contact? So I think these things are really important, but it gets back to that communication. And Laura, what is the business's duty of care to pregnant employees? Um, and how might it differ for those who are non-desk workers or workers who have shift patterns? Well, it leads into the um, suggestions for making those reasonable adjustments to support them in work, really, because there is that overriding duty to reduce workplace risk, particularly. And obviously, there's a legal obligation to carry out a risk assessment to make sure those risks are reduced in work. But you must also remember to carry out a, a specialist pregnancy-related risk assessment when someone is full pregnant, and to keep that updated, because obviously, you know, the pregnancy will develop, as Davina said, complications might arise. So keeping that up to date is important. Um, and, like, and it will lead into that, like you say, that open communication with the employee and they feel supported um, and want to, to give as much as they can to work throughout their pregnancy. And Laura, how should small businesses manage maternity leave? Well, as we know, roles in small businesses often are roles that wear many hats. Um, so there's, oh, you might be you know, taking that time out from work to, to have their baby. You're losing quite a key person with the business, potentially. You'll have all that customer knowledge, supplier contacts, all of that kind of thing. So planning is definitely the best piece of advice there. So it's having the conversation. So in, in addition to congratulating them, it's opening that conversation to start thinking about their plans for when they'd like to take their maternity leave, the legal entitlement is to 52 weeks. Do they want to take that full period? Do they want to take part of it? Have they got any thoughts about how they wish to use their accrued holiday as well? Um, it just all helps with that full planning and it can help actually reduce anxiety for the employee in doing so. But as an employer, it just enables you to prepare for a long lead time for the handover before they go on maternity leave so you can manage um, in their absence. But it's surprising actually the amount of businesses we speak to and they sort of ring us going um, can I talk to them about it what can I say well you I know, was just going to uh, ask yeah, you this the, nervous is, about yeah, the nervousness so. about it yeah tell me about that well they often feel like you know frustrated saying I don't know what's happening well you know, they're going to have a baby it's all going to be fine you know? but it's just having it's, it's absolutely fine and actually on a serious note it is showing that support and demonstrates and actually the employee will feel um, supported in doing so um, and having that conversation as well and there's obviously you know further legal entitlements we need to be mindful of so paid time off for antenatal appointments Again, if we've got that dialogue going, we want pre, uh, as much notice as we can, please, of those appointments. It might mean a couple of hours out to go to attend certain clinics of the business, and they're entitled to that paid time off. And also the right to return to the same job once they return from maternity leave, or if they've taken the, the full period, it might be they're returning to a suitable alternative role if there's um, um, business reasons for them not being able to return to the exact same role as previously. And obviously around that, the right not to be dismissed because of having a child, of course, and not to suffer a detriment by having taken that time out. There's obviously a risk of um, discrimination claims arising um, off the back of that if it's not handled properly. Um, and there is scope for businesses to take advice. So Boopa Growth Plus customers in particular do have access to an HR advisory service where they can seek advice and support should they need to do so. Very, very helpful and useful there. Um, Naveen, having children for the first time is, as we said, monumental event in someone's life. How should small businesses support new parents in the workplace and why is it so important? It's a really big one, isn't it? Yeah. Having Starting a family and having children or indeed expanding your family as well. And I think it's really important that businesses recognise the very positive role they can play in that process. Now, for people starting a family, while it's a, you know, a really wonderful thing to be doing, it can also be really fraught with feelings of uh, complete sort of overwhelm, um, feelings of loneliness, feelings of shame or guilt because they don't know what to do and don't know who to ask, etc. So perhaps being a supportive um, uh, a source of counsel could be really helpful and we've spoken a lot today about creating an open culture at work and I'd certainly extend that to conversations around starting a family and the, all the all the pressures and, and expectations that come with that. There are certain things that we know new parents will experience that can really have an impact on them in the workplace and I think some understanding goes a long way in helping them adjust to that. Common things like sleep deprivation, I think any parent will probably I was probably wondering if up. that was going to come up, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but sleep deprivation can have a real impact. And remember, this isn't just a sleep deprivation that occurs over a particular day or a weekend. It occurs over a very prolonged time frame and therefore can really have a knock-on effect on someone at work as well. So to recognise the impact of that could be helpful. There are no easy solutions to this, but just recognising that I think is a really helpful first step. Another thing is that childcare is really expensive and all the associated costs with childcare as well, or particularly if you are you know, looking at 
um, salary reviews or bonuses or indeed making cuts. This could have a real impact on your employees too. Sometimes, as Laura mentioned, there can be real concerns around job security as well. Starting a family or indeed expanding your family comes with risks of leaving the workplace and potentially missing opportunities for promotion or progression, particularly for women. And so perhaps some reassurance around that can be really, really helpful. To remind an individual of their value and how much you uh, recognise their talent can be really positive. And to ensure that when they come back to work, there's a real welcome and a recognition of what they're bringing back with them. We recognise that pregnancy is a, a really positive process but when a woman has her child there can for some people be a real period of feeling quite down and low after their pregnancy just because of the sheer overwhelm of the task that befalls them you have this you know young child in your presence 24 7 who depends on you for all of their needs and that can be really overwhelming particularly if you haven't got any support if you've never been given any guidance in terms of what to expect or indeed if you're doing everything right it can still be something which is a really fraught time so recognizing that postnatal depression may affect your employee is also really important I'd also extend that to the partner as well. While they don't experience a postnatal depression, it can certainly have a mental health impact on the partner of a pregnant individual too. So that recognition can be really helpful from an employer perspective. And so moving on from that then, if we consider what support your organisation can offer, it's not, you know, there isn't a one magic bullet that fits every pregnancy, but certainly, as mentioned, the open culture can be a really positive first step. And I think communicating regularly with your employee too just checking in with them seeing how they're doing because things change day to day they may be okay one week and actually struggling another week and so for you to have regular conversations can be a really good source of support we've spoken about flexible working and i think this is really useful for parents in particular they can't predict when for example their child may have a sleepless night or fall ill and therefore they can't predict what other needs they may need to address like taking their child to a doctor or addressing poor sleep and things of that nature so to offer flexible working can be really helpful too. And finally, on the point around um, people's concerns around their job security and career development, perhaps be mindful that those are the individuals you really want to be targeting those conversations to. If there's a training course being advertised or uh, an opportunity for a secondment, perhaps bear those individuals in mind because they may feel neglected or indeed be neglected because they've been off work for a while or weren't in your line of sight when those things came about. And then in terms of paid for services, you as an organisation may consider subscribing to an employee assistance programme because that can be a real source of um, independent support for your employees. Sometimes, despite all the you know, support you may provide and the open culture you may generate, it can be really difficult to speak to your employee about certain things. So your employer about certain yes, things, I yes. should say. And so investing in an employee assistance program can be really helpful to give them independent and external advice, much like you know, seeing a therapist, for example, uh, is also independent and, 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 and free of any judgments and, and such like as well. And as already mentioned uh, by Laura, with Bupa Growth Plus, if your teams are eligible, they can access that service too. It's, it is a, a real um, moment in time when you come back to work and you've got a, a young one and you maybe have extended your family. And I think one of the things that I've try to do in in my teams is make sure that there's no elephant in the room you know there's a, this the sense that this person has come back they're insecure they might not have slept all night long um, they want to do a good job they want to have their mark again in the in, in the workplace and I think it's for employee uh, employees to try and if they can be as open as they can about what their experience is but as an employer to make it an environment that you know you might talk about your your own experiences. Um, you might ask the rest of the group to share um, who else hasn't had a great night's sleep, to, um, you know, and just allow that to be an open conversation. Um, and I, I too often have I witnessed people really fearful about their career progression. And I think it's really um, a great point that you make to really take some time to secure to, to help them feel secure. And I think the more that they can feel secure, the more that they feel they can be open with you, the longer that person hopefully will stay with you, and also, but more than that, the more they'll enjoy their job, the more that they're going to contribute to the team and the culture of the organisation. Um, and I've, I've seen many, many times how that environment has fostered fantastic um, employees and, and, and that I've worked with for many, many years, and many pregnancies actually as well. Um, Laura, what guidance should small businesses be offering to employees who are returning to the workplace? 
Well, it's surprising to start with the number of businesses that call us saying, you know, we have an employee who's off on maternity leave saying, I, I'm, they haven't told me if they're coming back. Well, it's important to remember they, they are still your employee, they do remain employed, so unless they actually choose to resign, they are coming back. Um, and, ho and, like, and think in terms of advice, it's having having the conversation, speaking to them, picking up the phone, it's quite daunting return. They've been off for a number of months. They're probably very nervous and trying to sort of juggle everything to come back. We talk about that, the, the work-life balance, and a lot of women think, I think it's got to be you know, all one or the other, you know. And I think anything we can do as an employer to support that, like you, you said yourself, you know, can get the best out of, of your staff team. And, you know, they don't lose their work ethic. The other personal circumstances have changed. And I often think that new parents are often amazing multitaskers. And I think it's a bit of an untapped superpower, you know, to Agreed. be honest. You know, so if you, can, <laughs> if you can actually make good use of that and, and having those conversations, there's, of course, there's keeping in touch days as well. So they, there's up to 10 you can take during maternity leave. And they are um, days in which you can agree to come back into work. So say, for example, you're having a business update meeting. Don't forget about them and invite them to that. Um, it's a paid day at work for that day, or even equally, if you want to have some some um, update training generally, have a meeting to have a conversation ahead of their return. They might even want to do a couple of days here or there to ease themselves back into it and start, you know, start yeah. to pick things up and getting the feel for being in work again. It can all make that transition um, transition a lot easier and obviously if they do want to make a flexible working request to change their hours there is um, a formality to that where they write and, and, and make the application as an employer we can consider it. So. We have to, there, there are reasons where we can refuse it if we need to for, for commercial reasons um, that are there or try and have that conversation to come to a compromise if you, if you can. And it all ties into, as I say, that um, supporting that, that return to work for, for everyone's benefit, for the employer and the employee. Absolutely. Um, Naveen, tragically though, more than one in five pregnancies end in miscarriage in the UK each year. Um, how can businesses offer support in that circumstance? Yeah, we, we've spoken a lot about what businesses can do to support a pregnancy and I think all those things are really positive and really wonderful but I think there's also a responsibility to recognise as you say that some pregnancies don't go to full fruition and indeed there can be the loss of a child at any point during that pregnancy. The impact of that can be absolutely profound and I think one thing I found very useful was to consider that the loss of a child whether the child was delivered or not can be akin to a bereavement or an actual loss of somebody who is living and the impact on an individual is absolutely profound as a result of that. We recognise that people can experience feelings of anger, of guilt, of failure, um, of shame you know, really negative emotions that can be really deeply entrenched. And remember, it's not just the person who was pregnant um, who experiences these, but also their family and, and their partner as well, potentially. So it's really important to recognise the wider impact there too. We'd also recognise that some of these short-term feelings can actually become more entrenched longer-term, you know, thoughts as well and lead to mental health conditions like depression or anxiety, which need formal treatment medically as well. So there can be a real knock-on impact there. I think the things that we just described in terms of um, creating an openness and an inclusive culture really come into their own here because to have those difficult conversations requires what we call psychological safety and nobody is going to speak about these very deep negative emotions if they don't feel safe to do so. There can sometimes within a workplace be a sense of um, difficulty in starting the conversation because you may have been sharing in the excitement of the person as they you know progress through their pregnancy or may have bought them a gift during, for their pregnancy and suddenly they're now having to have a very different set of uh, conversations with you but for you to provide the safety for them to have those difficult conversations can be really helpful there may be unpredictable feelings like tearfulness or bursts of anger which i think are really appropriate because emotional ups and downs are part and parcel of this process and allowing the space and providing some understanding around that can be really really helpful. I'd also suggest that you may want to consider how you manage potential absences as well. Sometimes these feelings can be so overwhelming that actually taking time away from work can be the more healthier and productive thing for your employer in the long run than um, you know insisting they come into work despite those negative feelings and such like as well. And as a manager I think it's important that you are uh, equipped with the support from your own management and, and leadership in you know dealing with these very difficult conversations um, because they can be quite you know impactful on anyone that has to have them. 
From the point of view of Bupa as an organisation, we have um, online what's called a mental health hub, which provides a, a range of resources which are freely available. And sometimes just recognising that actually these feelings could be depression or these you know uh, uh, sensations could be anxiety can be really empowering for an individual. So please feel free to either make use of that yourself or direct employees if you feel that might be helpful. Similarly, if you have a Bupa health plan that has mental health cover, you are entitled to pick up the phone and speak to an advisor who can talk through your, your symptoms, ask you a few questions and then direct you to appropriate uh, resources or indeed specialists as well. If your cover extends to this, um, it can be the case that we can refer you on to a specialist without the need for you to see a GP as well. So making use of that can be really helpful. What I'd also say is that make use of um, charities as well. There are some fantastic organisations out there. I can think of uh, one called Tommy's, for example, which is really helpful uh, at sharing sort of um, almost peer support around miscarriage and loss of pregnancy too. With the best will in the world as an organisation, you may just not have the insights into what this individual is going through. And sometimes meeting other people who have gone through similar can provide a level of comfort that perhaps you as a workplace weren't able to achieve. Thank you so much. We're nearly at the end of our second session, but before we move on, let's look at the top takeaways from our experts. Supporting parents will not only help them, but the business will benefit from greater employee loyalty and retention. It's important business owners are aware of the full range of employment rights that pregnant women, new mothers and new fathers have. Touch base with parents before they return, consider flexible working and remember their personal circumstances may have changed, but their work ethic won't. We are now moving on to the third part of today's session supporting female cancer in the workplace. Naveen, for women in the UK, breast cancer is the most common cancer and one in seven will develop the disease in their lifetime. What adjustments can businesses make if an employee has chosen to stay in work whilst undergoing cancer treatment? Thank you for that figure of one in seven, Holly. That's really quite stark, isn't it? And what I'd also share is that one in two people in the UK will experience cancer at some point. And so actually, you know, broadening the conversation to all cancers, it's affecting many people at, at some point in their life. What we know is that cancer can affect people very differently and so it's really important that you take your cue from your employee but also consider what generic measures you can put in place in anticipation of an employee having a cancer. I think it's important to recognise that many people don't want to be defined by their illness. They are not a cancer, they are somebody who has a cancer and therefore recognising the impact of the condition on them but not defining them by it can be really important. Some may choose to work through part or all of their treatment in fact and so don't make assumptions about what cancer means. For some people cancer is just something they live with like diabetes or high blood pressure um, and for others it can be much more consequential. So taking the cue from the individual can be really helpful. For those that work, we know that work can be really um, fulfilling and really give you a sense of you know, purpose and function. And so allowing your employee to continue to work and making adjustments and providing support around that can really help give them a sense of self and a sense of purpose and start to explore that with them if you can. I'd also say be mindful of some of the symptoms that occur around cancer and also some of the inconveniences that may come about because of it as well. A very really con common symptom is tiredness, for example, which I know we can all experience from time to time, but with a cancer it can be even more profound and really have an impact on how you do your day-to-day -day, uh, duties, how you dispel your, 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 your functions, etc. So do be conscious of that and if you can provide adjustments for that, such as working adjusted hours, um, working from home, um, even providing rest breaks during the day, that could be really fruitful. In terms of the inconveniences that cancer can cause, as well as the obvious things, you know, some individuals need to have regular blood tests or attend regular appointments or take regular calls from their doctor. And actually providing the space and the flexibility for that can be really helpful. It can be quite difficult for an employee to lean on your kindness and say, oh gosh, I've got another thing to ask of my employer. Will they, you know, when will I break the straw of that, of that camel's back, yeah. which is, you know, all the kindness that you've given them so far. So to recognize that there should be a culture around not feeling ashamed or not feeling good guilty for asking for support can also be really, really helpful. And for you to actively preempt that conversation by saying, what can we do to help? Do you need some time around appointments this week? And having regular contacts can be really helpful as well. 
I'd also recognise, um, rather ask employees to recognise the uh, psychological impact of cancer as well. You know, it's not just a physical condition, uh, and, and as serious as it is, it also has psychological impacts as well. An individual can really feel uh, many things from feeling quite low to feeling depressed, feeling anxious, guilt, shame, um, a complete, you know, sort of uh, detachment from things, in fact, um, a denial of their cancer and all the impact it's having. And so to be able to navigate that can be really helpful as well. I'm not expecting employers to be experts in this, but to recognise that many people have many different emotional responses can be a helpful first port of call. And Laura, what is a business's legal responsibility to employees who are experiencing cancer? So if you have a member of staff who, who has cancer, they're protected under the Equality Act 2010 um, from the point of diagnosis. So it doesn't have to be any sort of um, long-term um, prognosis or anything like that. It's from, from that point of diagnosis, they're automatically protected. And what that does is place an obligation on the employer to make reasonable adjustments. Now that could be things like allowing more time off for appointments, being flexible around hours if they're feeling the effects of any treatment they're going through. Um, it might also mean um, if you have an absence uh, trigger system so it might be a system whereby you might issue warnings for excessive absences. Obviously, taking account of any, think that any absences might be connected to their, their cancer and discounting that from your calculations. They're not unfairly um, penalised um, for that. But similarly, if you have a member of staff who has a partner, for example, they're caring for, or, a, or even, a, even a child or another member of their family um, who um, is struggling themselves, maybe it's mentally or otherwise, um, in caring for them and supporting that, there's such a thing as associative discrimination. So it's not the employee that has the disability per se, it's, uh, say, a member of their family. And if uh, an employer treats them less favourably because of that, because perhaps they're, they're sort of not, not quite with it, if they're kind of feeling anxious about it or their the mind's elsewhere, or they might have a more periods of absence due to it, it's making sure they are, they are in a protected position. So it's really important as a, as a business to be aware of those, um, of those things. That's fascinating. Naveen, what are some of the most common myths that prevent women from going for their smear test or mammogram? And how can small businesses promote more awareness around screening? Screening is really important and I think as a doctor of course I would say this but please please do attend for your screening appointments. They are there for your own protection and to pick up cancers before they've developed and while we can do much for them. The two kinds of screening available to women as you mentioned are cervical screening where a woman has a smear test and uh, breast screening via a mammogram, a particular kind of x-ray. And let me speak about both of those if I may just to dispel please. some of the myths around them. So to your question around why women don't seek out screening, there can be many factors but one is um, embarrassment or a fear of the unknown. I think some people anticipate there'll be a, a particularly invasive procedure or the pain of the procedure. Um, sometimes there can be a shame or a, or a guilt around having uh, screening as well. What I'd invite women to consider is that doctors perform screening all the time. For us, it's a really regular and routine part of our day. I know for a woman, building up the courage to have a screening uh, examination or process can be really fraught. But remember, for us, it's a day-to-day -day thing. And that's not to minimise the feelings you're experiencing, because I take on board any woman and any man's uh, feelings around any medical intervention or process. But remember, we do this all the time. We're used to making you feel comfortable. We're used to any concern or anxiety you have. And we would welcome you to have your screening with us. From my perspective, I'd like to share that Bupa does offer screening to women who would like to take screening up with us. As part of our offerings in Bupa Health Clinics, you can access a women's health assessment or indeed just seek out a cervical smear or a mammogram as a separate service as well. We can offer these to women from the age of 25 for a cervical smear up to any age and from 40 up to any age for mammogram screening. But I should also add, these are available in the NHS and are completely free from the age of 25 for a cervical smear up to 70 and from the age of uh, 50 up to 70 uh, for a mammogram. So please do take these up for free via the NHS if you would like to as well. Thank you so much. How can businesses support employees returning to work after cancer? So I think from my point of view, what I would say is that Anyone that returns to work from cancer needs to have an open culture and an opportunity to explore their feelings should they show wish and perhaps make you as their employer aware of some of their needs that have arisen because of their cancer. 
sometimes the needs will be very obvious, such as uh, surgical uh, uh, sites or other impacts that are physical, but sometimes they won't be, such as the psychological impacts or other things that are not necessarily obvious to you because people can be quite good at masking their symptoms and hiding things from their employer, particularly if they don't feel safe in their workplace to share with you. So creating a culture around openness can be really, really helpful and encouraging an individual to perhaps be open about their feelings, should they so wish, can also be helpful too. They may not take you up on that at the first offer, but it may be uh, after a few prompts, they may finally have a conversation with you. I'd also encourage you to consider formally as a line manager, what one-to-one -one conversations you want to have with your employee. As with any employer that's taken time off work for any sickness, you want to know whether there is anything you need to do as an organization to help them with their return to work. And the same applies to cancer as well. But perhaps when consider with cancer, because of the psychological impacts that we've already spoken of, it can be even more important to have that conversation and even more important to have it sensitively as well. So things like discussing um, their desire to work flexible hours, for example, other adjustments they may need to make, such as using restroom facilities, uh, changing dressings, the need for hydration, uh, fans, etc. There can be many needs that we don't necessarily know of, obviously, but that the employee may well share with you. And remember, they've gone through their condition, so they'll know what adjustments may help them. And I'd certainly invite you to invite those conversations as well. Sometimes it's also uh, important to recognise that cancer isn't just a one-off process. There isn't just one operation or one cycle of treatment it can be something which goes on over a protracted period of time. Indeed, we now have people who live with cancer as a chronic disease, just like they live with diabetes or high blood pressure. So consider that your adjustments may need to be long-term, not just short-term as well. Some people may also benefit from uh, having a mini induction when they return to work after a protracted period of absence. Um, I know off camera, Laura and I were speaking about the concept of a mini induction, whereby when someone's been away from work for a period of time, they may have forgotten some of the more basic day-to-day -day things that they took for granted, such as what, you know, passwords to use for what programs. And so just get providing the time and the space to do that can be really, really helpful. I'd end by saying that the key is to be empathic and just to be as supportive as possible and as open as possible and understanding as possible. We're not expecting you to have all the answers to manage a very complex medical condition, but certainly empathy and an openness around how you approach your employees can be really helpful. I think empathy is that word, isn't it, here, in that anyone I've known that's gone through cancer, there is a different frame of mind that they come out with. Um, certainly, you know, l looking at mortality or their purpose in life and what they want to achieve and um, the love of their family. And they've gone through something, you know, absolutely, it's been one of the scariest things that they've ever done. And so I think that relationship, again, is so key that actually it could be that they want to look at how they can maybe expand their job, maybe look at flexible working, they want to take up that hobby that they always wanted to do, but they don't want to give up their job. So I think having that, again, we, we talk about this environment, it's, it's playing through, isn't it, with everything, having the environment to be open and to support someone with empathy is just absolutely key for a fantastic relationship. Um, Laura, what advice would you give to businesses on how to support employees who might be on long-term sickness? So long-term sickness should be covered under your sickness absence policy um, within your employee handbook. Um, it's a useful tool for managers or as a business owner to understand the process to be followed through, but also for the employee to be aware of um, how regularly they need to keep you updated with regard to their ongoing absence. So what we should be receiving is timely um, sick notes or fit notes as they're called um, to notify any um, further periods of absence. I'd also um, encourage regular communication. We often get businesses feeling a bit apprehensive as to, well, they're unwell, should I make contact with them? And I think there's definitely a balance. We don't want to be hounding them and keeping you know, all the time, but similarly, we don't want to leave them um, at sea either. So having regularly timed welfare meetings, for example, now that can be um, a starting point, could be an invitation to the workplace if they're physically able to do so, depending on their condition, or it could be done by a video call or a telephone call, just to have an update as to how they're feeling, what's been the update um, from their GP or consultant, what is their prognosis? And that could then lead into a conversation around um, supporting a return to work if and when that's possible so can we make can we encourage them back with a phased return or support them in doing so um, can we give lighter duties for a, a temporary period of time to help with that as well and it might be actually that um, obtaining an occupational health or a, a GP's and medical more in-depth medical report obviously you'd need the employee's consent to do that first 
And it may be actually we reach the point of, well, there aren't any reasonable adjustments we can make to their um, current role they're employed under. There aren't any suitable alternative roles we can offer. We've had someone off for you know, a number of months. And it may be we're looking at possible um, termination of employment for medical capability grounds. Now, that does need to be handled carefully. And I would urge um, businesses thinking about that to take advice before doing so. Obviously, you mentioned before, those um, Boopa Growth Plus customers do have access to the HR advisory service if they want some additional um, support with that. Um, but also, in terms of how you handle that, obviously, there's the unfair dismissal risk that could be exposed there if it's handled poorly. But just generally, in terms of the, that longer absence, if the employee feels you know, aggrieved or upset about how it's been managed, we do see quite a number of grievances. And again, what that will do is elongate the period perhaps they're absent from the business, it will sour, potentially sour relationships. Um, so it's really important to, to handle it in the right way from the outset. And it's not just that person, isn't it? It's the culture of the organisation, yeah. those colleagues that might be supporting. It's, it's such an important thing to deal with correctly. Um, Naveen, what are some of the services small businesses can use or promote that will help support employees experiencing cancer? So reassuringly, from Bupa's point of view, we have a couple of things that I'd like to highlight, and these are available to individuals who are eligible for these particular services, if their cover permits. The first is mental health cover, which we've already spoken of, but just to remind uh, our listeners, what that is, is a service, uh, a helpline rather, where they can call in and speak to an advisor who will take some details from them and will be able to direct the member to an appropriate mental health uh, service or, or provision. Sometimes if they need to see a specialist, that can be done via this service as well, uh, and therefore that can um, remove the need to see a GP beforehand. Secondly, I'd, I'd also mention Bupa's full cancer cover, which is where a, a member will be covered for any treatments and costs that can be incurred because of their cancer. We also have Bupa um, direct access for cancer cover as well, whereby an individual can call one of our cancer um, specialists and speak to them on the phone and be seen uh, by a specialist in person rather than having to go via their GP for symptoms that may be suggestive of a cancer as well. And then finally, in terms of paid for services, um, within our clinics, we do offer women's health checks and also breast and cervical health checks as well uh, as a focus around cancer screening as well. And so if a woman wants to see a GP for generic symptoms and discuss those, she can do so as part of a health check. Or if she wants to undertake a cervical smear or a mammogram, she can do that as part of those cancer checks as well. Thank you. We have reached the end of our session today. Thank you to Laura and Naveen for joining me. We hope you found it useful. See you next time.